I'm not going to talk about all of our values because we have lots of them, but I want to talk about four specifically today. And I wouldn't say all four are my favorites, but they're in the top five. <laughs> the first one is accountability and ownership. Surprise. I tell you, to me, this is by far our most important value. Being accountable and owning your business. When I say be the CEO of your position, I mean imagine you owning your business and your business is <coughs> being an admissions professional, being in student finance, being a business office manager, being a SAM, being an instructor, being a career services professional, being a director in any of those departments, and acting and behaving and positioning yourself as the true owner of that function. You have to be able to visualize it first, right? Because sometimes what I do when I talk to people about various things, I say, well, how are you doing? How's everything coming along in your department and campus? They say, well, everything is doing great. You know, one of the reasons I, you know, missed my target last month is because he said, she said, this person was late, that person doesn't care, people are all around me, they want me to fail, nobody listens to me. Nobody comes through, but I am, I own it. I am fully accountable. No, you're not! <laughs> you are not accountable when you blame everybody except yourself. It all starts with you owning it. Ownership is the most important. But you know, this is so hard to do. You know why it's hard to do? Because all of us are socialized. From the time we were kids, to find out what's wrong with the world around us. And we, have, we become experts at it. We become experts at figuring out what's wrong with people and things and organizations around us. We're experts. We are articulate. We are eloquent when it comes to finding faults in people. How many of you have spouses, cousins, nephews, <laughs> sisters, brothers? How many of you have them? Okay. I guarantee you, I guarantee it, if I give you a tablet of 100 pages for you to list what's wrong with every member of your family, <laughs> including your kids, your spouses, your cousins, you will fill out the 100 pages. <laughs> and you are very, you will be very articulate because you've thought about it before, right? You see, my wife is nodding in the back. Yes! I'm writing about you right now as we we're speaking. <laughs> That's what people do. Because we are socialized as kids to find what's wrong with the people around us. So by the time you enter the workforce, that's the expertise you have. Right? If I asked you to do a counter exercise, to write about the amazing personality traits and attributes of your spouses, your kids, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, if you really work hard, you will maybe complete two pages with large fonts. <laughs> right? You know it's true. So developing the skill to say, it's all me. I influence the world around me. I own, I own the journey 
I own the accountability. I make every mistake myself. That's when you will truly and authentically be liberated as a human being. So try this once. Try it when somebody at your campus, some department, some, when they do something wrong, you raise your hand and say, it's my mistake. I did it. I own it. Even if you don't have anything to do with that function. <laughs> do you know what's going to happen immediately? You will earn everybody's respect. Again, you shouldn't just say it for fun. You should mean it. <laughs> you should mean it. You should mean it because you know why? Because people who truly, authentically own problems will solve them. Because what we want to do, we want to spend 5 to 10% of our time finding problems. Because you want to find out the problem, right? Not talk about it. Because, you know, everybody's an expert. You know, expertise. All of you are experts at this. I am an expert, too. What's wrong? Because from the time I was two, I've been trained and socialized to find out what's wrong. Second thing, who did it? <laughs> who did it? Because once you find out who did it, it's over. You feel better. As long as you didn't do it, life is good. Right? Remember, everybody's expertise. What's wrong and who did it? Imagine a world, you find out what's the problem, and I did it. Then you spend 90% of your time focusing on solutions. And when you focus on solutions, because this is a problem owners have. If you're a true owner, and all of you here are owners, right? If you're a true owner, you know what you want to do? You want to solve the problem. But that's not the best way. The best way is identify the problem, take personal responsibility and accountability for it, and then involve your entire community to help solve it. Be inclusive. People want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Be included so people feel respected. So people feel they belong. So people feel they matter. Look at all, like you, all of you are amazing. I tell you, if I worked with you on every, day, every day, all of you are going to be solving my problems. <laughs> Seriously. Right? Who knows how to solve a problem better than the people doing the work every day? If you want to solve problems in education, ask instructors. Ask your best instructors to help you improve student retention. That's how it's going to happen. Again, it comes with ownership and accountability. But you have to fight this incredible urge. How many of you like ice cream? I don't see Sanjay and my <laughs> wife's hand. Yeah, there, yeah. Okay, ice cream is... A lot of people's kryptonite, right? So your urge when you see something you like is to gravitate toward it, right? That's what you do, right? So you have to fight that urge of finding fault and what's wrong with the world around you, right? Don't see what everybody's problems are because once they're on your team, they are there for a specific reason. They are there to solve problems. Let them do it. But you have to own it, regardless of your position, right? If you're an instructor, if you're an admissions professional, or if you're in student finance, if you're in the business office, if you're in career services, you've got to own the responsibility. Nobody's going to do your work. If you fail, just say, I failed, but mean it. 
Because if you mean it, then you'll do something about it as an owner. If you just say it because it's cool and it's part of our culture, we'll know. You know, after 10 times, if you fail and you say, oh, oh, I own it. No, I don't believe you. <laughs> you, know? you know, like I'm not that smart, but I didn't fall off a turnip truck either. So when you say you own it, I want to know what you're doing to exhibit and demonstrate accountability and ownership. What are you doing? Owners ask for help. Accountable people always raise their hand and say, help me. Owners make difficult decisions. Difficult decisions for difficult problems. That's true ownership. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Do you? I, I'm not feeling it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Now I hear you. You know what I'm saying, right? True accountability, true ownership requires you, every single one of you, regardless of your title. Your title doesn't make you better or worse. Your title just separates functions at, at, in our organization. All of you can be more if you want to. But you need to accept that there is a solution to the most difficult problems. Right? You know, do you want me to give you a funny career services example? Okay, you heard the good ones, right? Uh, what Taylor did in uh, South Florida, right? That's a fantastic one. That's true ownership along with the amazing EDs and, and Michael uh, Cole in South Florida. They said, you know, we're better than this. We have this problem. We're going to be as good as the best career services campus with an IEC. And they got there because they accepted responsibility for it. They didn't set limits. They, had, they did what they had to do because you know why? Because they know our students deserve better. Always think about the obsession with the student, right? And again, you know, I've been in this business 30 years. I was like two years old. Little fart out here, going into a classroom. <laughs> 30 years, I have heard it all. I have to tell you, I can write a book of excuses and, and what. But I have favorites. I have favorites with excuses and stuff. And this involves uh, the Bakersfield campus, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is one of our best campuses. Every year, every year, because of who? Chris Callisto. Chris Callisto. So all of you know I love Chris. You, all of you know that, right? I'll, do all of you know that? I love Chris. Chris and I go way back. So I love Chris because he's amazing. He never returns my emails. He never responds. <laughs> and, you know, and sometimes I think I send him an email and Ali says, you know, Dr. Frateri sent an email. It's, not, it's rude to not to respond to him after a month. <laughs> so, so I sent him an email a month ago. He responds to me yesterday. <laughs> and of course... You know, he, he does a reply all. He does a reply all. Oh, I'm sorry I, I ignored your email. It wasn't important enough for me. Uh, but I want to tell you uh, I hear you and I will participate. Well, very kind of you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, of course, this was the most recent. We have a few situations going back. But, you know, back in the day, this is, I want to say like it's six years ago, seven years ago maybe, so I was on this call. I used to kind of do these stealth things on calls. I used to go on calls all the time. And back then, people couldn't tell. Now people know I'm on the call. I don't know what it is. I have to complain to IT. Everybody knows when I'm on the call, everybody says, Dr. Fateri, welcome. Oh, shoot. I'm, you're not supposed to know I'm here. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> but back then, you know, 
you know, our IT wasn't as good as it was today, <laughs> or people just didn't even care, or whatever. <laughs> so I, I used to go on those calls all the time, just because I love being on calls, just on the background, because that's how I learn, right? I'm a learner. And, you know, people like me, you know, like I'm not as smart as other people, so what I have, I have to work that much harder to learn. So I have to go on calls. You learn a lot on these calls. Admissions, financial aid, career services, education, they're amazing. So I'm on this career services call with uh, uh, the director of career services in Bakersfield. This is way back when, you know, right now they're amazing. Uh, this is, that's why I'm bringing up the example, historic, so I don't offend anybody. So Chris is on the call, director of career services, and they're having this incredible problem placing me medical assistant graduates. And they're far behind. All the other programs are fine. This one is problematic. So our regional at that point is asking, well, what's going on with your MA? You know, you're short, you know, 15 people. Your placement is low. The dun, the dun, it's going on. And the director of career services run out of excuses uh, because there were a few ones I've heard. You know, students are not interested. You know, they don't want a job. Uh, they don't want to get a job. You know, the, the, the usual all of you in career services have heard, right? And then the director of career services, the regional wasn't buying the excuses. And I'm learning, right? I'm listening. And the director of career services said, well, what happens between the months of March through May is that our graduates, because we live in the Central Valley, Bakersfield is in the Central Valley, uh, it's grape picking season. And all of them in, are involved in picking grapes. <laughs> and so they're not coming for their interviews with employers. So I immediately, my interest was ignited. <laughs> because I had never in my, at that point, 25 years, had never heard that excuse. So I take that mute thing off, and I said, excuse me, excuse me, hi, this is Fardad. Um, tell me a little bit about your grape picking season. <laughs> so she, then she says, oh yeah, from March through May, and Chris is on the call, right? March through May, it's grape picking season, and our students don't come for interviews because their families and they're all involved in grape picking season. I said, just the MA graduates? She says, oh, yeah, well, yes, it just happens that... So I said, okay, thank you. I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable. As you know, I'm, I'm, I don't like to make people uncomfortable. So I get done, and I called Chris immediately. I said, uh, Mr. Callisto. He said, sir, sir, don't say... Any I know exactly what you... <laughs> so I want to let you know, like, there are a million legitimate excuses and finger pointing that can go on, right? From the incredibly ridiculous and funny like grape picking to we lost the student's phone number. But to me, there's no excuse, right? Not all of our students graduate. It's hard to graduate from our programs for the million reasons you know. So for me, it is so hard, it's almost impossible to believe our students paid $19,000, go through eight or nine months or two years, through all that struggle with childcare, transportation, four hours a day, five days a week, to pick grapes? <laughs> I miss an interview? You know how that's going to be hard to believe, right? Or to say, my, our grad, oh, they don't want a job. They just wanted to finish the program and just sit home and do whatever they were. You know how hard it is to believe that, right? It's not that I, won't, I, don't, I don't trust. But our students come to us for employment, right? So, again, ownership, accountability, own it. Like that director of career services should have said, okay, we missed it. We're going to fix it, and this is how I'm going to do it. But if you believe grape-picking season is real, 
you will never find a solution because you are going to drown yourself in that blame. Does that make sense? So all of you, I'm sure, have similar grape-picking season excuses <laughs> that you hear from different people, right, at your campuses, right? I mean, our career service is far advanced now. I mean, Joan, if she hears that on a call, probably would go to Bakersfield and shoot somebody. But, <laughs> but of course, Bakersfield right now is one of our best performing placement departments. Not just placement, but everything. Everything. I mean, I think everybody from Bakersfield is here, right? Yes? Who, Bakersfield, where are you? Get, please stand up. Oh, see? Our Director of Career Services, Alex Ford, is here. One of the best we have in the company now. So from great picking season to Alex Ford. Doesn't get any better. Right? But it comes with ownership, right? So, you know, sometimes your community doesn't have enough positions for certain programs. Chris told us three years ago, we have X number of positions for pharmacy technician graduates. We cannot accept more than X number of starts in PT. We said, yes, sir, let's not accept for more than that. But you need to own it. I don't know Bakersfield. Chris does. Well, Chris does now. He was, he was new to Bakersfield <laughs> until seven years ago. But, but you have to tell us that. We want to secure employment for our students to graduate. So if there aren't enough jobs in the community, let's cap enrollment on the front end. And Chris had the ownership to do that. Right? So again, you've got to own it. Does that make sense? Digest, please di spend time to digest this and make it a part of you. Because, and, 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 and please make sure everybody at your campuses and your departments understand this, but it needs to become a part of their psyche because it will help you not just professionally but also personally. Yeah. Remember? Remember your objective in life has to be to make that 100-page booklet full of positives attributes and personality traits and not a hundred pages of negatives and blames and finger pointing. Once you achieve that, then that means you have transformed yourself. Right? Okay. Where's Jackie? Jackie is easy. I want to ask Jackie to share about her experiences and the IEC culture. Thank you, Dr. Terry. And congratulations to all of you for being here. Such a nice, you know, it's nice to see so many faces. For 26 years, I have been lucky to call this company and definitely my campus my home. The, the very first moment I stepped into UEI, I was excited about what UEI has had to offer. And definitely, hopeful for the future. UEI culture revolves around the ability to help our students to achieve the highest success possible. We all know our student success is our success. Their hardship is definitely our hardship. And their failure is definitely our failure. This mentality for years helped me to get closer to the community Therefore, resulting the best outcome for my campus and definitely for my students. Each day, I walk into my campus excited, nervous, ready with a positive attitude and ready for challenges that will be thrown my way. And we all know there's many. However, at the end of the day, my goal is to leave knowing one thing. I made a difference in someone's life. And that's very important to me. We're very, very lucky to be rooted, to have our career rooted in education. As I push my kids to succeed, and I do, all of you guys know that, I do the same for my students. It's very important for me. And I urge my team to uphold what's really important to get us closer 
together to definitely achieve top talent that Dr. Fateri always talks about it. I've been in all positions, customer service coordinator, director of admissions, admission representative, director of education, and today as campus president. But one thing I know, my team, the supportive team, the supportive backbone, and definitely motivating future has helped me to be where I am and definitely who I am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fateri. Wow. You know, when you hear Jackie, what do you feel in her? What else? Yes, love, passion, ownership. What else? What? Pride. Pride. Right? Jackie has a lot of pride. 